Good morning. Um, thank you first to the Microbiology Society for awarding me this prize, which I'm very much honoured to receive on behalf of my research group, both past and present. Uh, secondly, I'd just like to thank Tracy and Fatma for nominating me for this prize. So this morning, I'm going to talk about the research that my group has been undertaking using mathematical modelling to inform malaria elimination and eradication strategies. And I'm going to focus in particular on the interface uh, between the research and policy. So where are we with malaria today? Well, over the last 20 years, we've made huge progress in reducing the malaria burden globally. Um, and that's due to both dramatic investment and funds from 2000 onwards, which has resulted in a third, nearly 30% decline in malaria case incidents, a 60% reduction in mortality. And importantly, 21 countries have eliminated malaria, 10 of which have been certified as having done so by the WHO. Much of this success has been attributed to the rollout of insecticide treated bed nets and coverage has increased, but, but gaps remain. So for example, half of children in Africa are estimated to be sleeping under a bed net each night. But of course, that means the other half are still unprotected. And therefore, because malaria is such an intense infection and in certain parts of the world, particularly in Africa, that does mean that it remains a major public health problem with nearly 230 million cases estimated to have occurred in 2019 and just over 400,000 deaths, primarily in young children. And what we're seeing across the globe now are two very different patterns depending on the different areas you look in. Um, many countries, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa, are really stuck in what we call a control phase, um, where there is still a large burden of cases that causes a huge demand on the health systems. So, for example, 95% of the global cases across 87 endemic countries are actually occurring in just 29 of those. And you'll see on this pie chart that all of, but one of those countries are in Africa. The other country outside Africa is India, which is a very large population. Um, and unfortunately, although there was much progress made in the early half of the century so far, um, the reduction in case incidents has plateaued in recent years, and we've seen a real sort of leveling off since 2015. In contrast, outside Africa, there's been huge progress made with eliminating um, the disease in many countries um, in Asia and so South Africa, South America. Um, and so we're seeing an increase in the number of countries moving towards malaria elimination. And um, just uh, last year, there were two new countries and China was one of those. So very um, significant success in terms of elimination. And these successes in terms of elimination have really been down to a renewed commitment um, and in particular, a really strong commitment from the national governments and associated funding for that. And elimination we know can occur in many settings with the combination of both the existing tools, but also equally important is that strong engagement of government and very strong surveillance, tracking cases down to the very last um, few. However, in contrast, there's many countries that remain struggling uh, to control the malaria burden. And there are many facets that contribute to this difficulty. Um, firstly, we are relying as a community on a few core tools, in particular, the insecticides that are on bed nets and also sprayed on walls, indoor residual spraying. Um, and this is, of course, inevitably leading to the evolution of resistance. Uh, drug resistance is a particular issue in uh, the Greater Mekong region in Southeast Asia, whilst insecticide resistance to um, the vector control tools has really grown across Africa, in particular in relation to the pyrethroids on bed nets. Um, and furthermore, we're also seeing, interestingly, a resistance to the diagnostics, the rapid diagnostic tests and a deletion in one of the core genes, meaning that the tests no longer identify um, the parasites. Coupled with this, there are a lot of issues in terms of access. There are coverage gaps, as I stated at the start, but also there are hard to reach populations. So coverage and access to interventions and to treatment is unequal, and it is typically the rural and the poorer populations that are hit hardest. 
Um, there's weak surveillance coupled with this, so not really knowing how much malaria burden is there. And then there are many settings, of course, that experience conflict, and that makes access to um, both interventions and treatment challenging. And coupled with this, there's a significant funding gap. So whilst funding did increase in the um, first decade, it has plateaued, um, as you'll see from this, this, this uh, top graphic, uh, it falls well below the estimated need required globally. And this has stayed level um, since 2016 at around the three uh, billion pounds. And in particular, there's a heavy reliance of funding from international donors and a heavy reliance on just a few very large donors. And they, of course, include the US and the UK. So recent cuts um, to aid budgets could have quite an impact on malaria. So how does modeling come into all of this? Um, well, a lot of the work we do has been trying to understand the potential impact of different interventions, both current tools and novel tools. And the models are ideally set up to look at how best to reduce transmission of the parasite and therefore impact on uh, both cases and deaths. And so, for example, for the transmission reduction strategies, we're trying to work out how best can we sustain both the gains that have been made in reducing malaria transmission and also potentially optimize those tools and the combinations of those tools to achieve further gains. We also, of course, look at new tools. There's a lot of research in this area, very active research, much of that undertaken in the UK. Um, and we look at what profiles of new drugs need to be, new vector control tools and um, vaccines and diagnostics, and how can we best optimize those tools as they come online. And then finally, of course, there's a big question about whether the malaria parasite can be eradicated with these tools. So I won't go into details of the sort of models we use. They are the typical transmission models that everybody, of course, in this country is quite familiar with now, given the COVID pandemic. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're trying to simulate the transmission of the parasite primarily focusing on Plasmodium falciparum uh, between the mosquitoes and people as a continuous cycle. We also look at the earlier stages of mosquito development and that's the larval stages and how these are um, related to the environment in particular to rainfall which drives very strong seasonal patterns and also into the wider ecology that drives the um, environment's ability to host the mosquito population. And through building these models, we spend a lot of time trying to capture some of the key dynamics of uh, malaria transmission, things like the development of naturally acquired immunity in the human population, the variation that we see in both asymptomatic and what we call subpatent malaria infections, those that aren't detected by the standard diagnostics, um, the different patterns of mosquitoes, um, there are very many different species, they all behave differently and those have impacts in terms of how interventions work. And then also looking at the other uh, plasmodium species, in particular plasmodium vivax, which has a very different pattern of relapse in the human. On top of these transmission models, we also try to then develop models for each individual intervention and then layer these together to see how we can best combine interventions. Um, and there are many different tools currently in use to try to reduce malaria burden. Um, vector control focuses on bed nets and spraying of walled indoor residual spraying with some larval control in, in countries. Uh, treatment, of course, is a really important aspect um, to reduce onward complications of malaria and early, tre early treatment is particularly important. But there are also ke chemo prevention strategies in place in seasonal areas in West Africa. Um, this is drugs given to children um, to try and prevent episodes of malaria and is also given to pregnant women um, as an intermittent strategy to try and prevent the consequences of malaria in pregnancy. And as one goes down to lower levels of transmission, mass drug um, strategies are also being used. Alongside this, we have lots of new tools and things like um, the genetically modified mosquitoes are very much of interest. And we have a new a malaria vaccine that I'll talk a little bit about later. And what the model, we try to do with the models is work through how these different interventions um, 
would be useful right from the early development stage, the preclinical stage, looking at target product profiles, through to the field evaluation, understanding and generalizing results from randomized clinical trials, then through to the final stage of implementation and policy, looking at the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of the interventions alone and in combination. So much of our work is actually supporting global policy and we work very closely um, with agencies such as the World Health Organization, uh, Organization and the Global Fund. Um, and a core part of our work um, in the recent years has been to support the development of the global technical strategy for malaria, which is a policy document outlining the plans between 2016 and 2030. We also work with WHO um, to use modeling to inform policy recommendations, both for existing and for new tools, and some of these are shown here. And we work closely with the Global Fund then to think about with the money coming in, how can that be distributed optimally to try to achieve the maximum impact? And much of this actually strays over into advocacy, trying to estimate how many lives have been saved and how many future lives can be saved. And that, of course, generates funding to these global agencies. So this just gives some of the examples of the work that we did back in 2013-14 that in, informed the WHO Global Technical Strategy. And in that, we looked at different scenarios um, for uh, uh, the forward projections from 2015 onwards. And those different scenarios are shown in the right-hand graphs. Um, the blue line was what we expected to see if everything stayed about the same. And then the others were adding and layering interventions um, to try to achieve greater impact. And unfortunately, of course, the funding has limited the impact that can be achieved and actually cases have plateaued over this early period so far to 2020. And this modeling directly then informed uh, the table on the left of this screen, which shows the goals that were set back in 2015 um, for the world to achieve both through milestones in 2020 and 2025, and then a final target in 2030. Um, and these goals had an initial milestone by 2020 of reducing case incidents and mortality rates by 40% compared to 2015. And unfortunately, these are way off target and actually case incidents and mortality has shifted very little um, over the previous five years. Uh, this was the first time as well that a global strategy looked at elimination targets, and that's something else that we looked at in the model, at trying to work out what could be achieved uh, across the globe, and that map of potential elimination countries is shown in the bottom of the screen. And that has been on track, that's been very successful, so the original goal was for at least 10 further countries to be um, achieving elimination status by 2020, and that is being achieved. Um, the second area then is to say when we have these scenarios, those um, previous results I showed you were with unconstrained funding, but we know that funding is limited. So how can we better optimize um, the existing funding that is available to make further gains? And how we go about this, and this is very much work closely undertaken with the Global Fund, is to run the model at a subnational level and try to optimize the different tools that are needed. So for example, having much higher bed net coverage in countries with the highest burden, which is where we really need to achieve the biggest reductions. And we can run through millions of different scenarios of how we allocate that money both within countries and between countries to try and then do a formal minimization of the global malaria cases and deaths. And this next slide just gives an example of that, of how with the available funding that was uh, there between 2017 and 2020, how we would target vector control. And of course, as you would expect, the majority of the vector control would go to the highest burden countries if we're trying to minimize the impact on cases and deaths. Um, and that's very much focused in the high endemic areas in Africa. And outside those areas, we would recommend more targeted controls, so really better understanding um, the um, scope of malaria and targeting the vector control at those areas with the highest incidence of cases. We've also worked very closely with countries um, to try and inform their strategies. 
Um, so we've invited um, help to develop uh, technical guidance um, through WHO to support national malaria control programs and also ran a number of workshops in country uh, to try and help talk through how the models can be used to inform the policy and this is particularly around trying to optimize what's done at the subnational level and then directly inform the grant applications that the countries put in to the global fund. And this is an example of work that we did in collaboration with PATH and the National Malaria Elimination Programme in Zambia, um, who launched an elimination plan in 2016. And this front graph just shows some of the outputs from our modeling work in terms of the likely impact that could be achieved with the choices that were being made by the country in terms of where to allocate the resources they had available. Um, so the modeling here informed the spatial stratification, what to put where, and we continue to engage with this and many other national programs as new issues arise and to update these results. And the final area I just wanted to talk about was back to the science and using the modeling to inform product and intervention development. And I think this is quite an exciting area where a lot more can be done. Um, so what we try to do is understand the science behind the new interventions, run and develop models in much, very much in collaboration with those developing uh, the tools and see how these modeling um, outputs can inform target product profiles. So what sort of profile needs to be achieved in order to have an impact in the field. We then can also use the models to inform field design, trying to understand the best design for quite complex randomized controlled trials. And then also the operations research, how to optimize delivery and take up of these new tools as they come through. And the graph here shows some work we did on a rapid diagnostic test. This was work closely undertaken with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we used the modeling to say how much more sensitive would a test need to be. Um, and as you can see, as you go backwards from the right hand side to the left of this graph, as you get a more sensitive test, you of course, um, detect more infections, but there's a point at which this appears to plateau off and therefore trying to invest even more in making the test more sensitive will have limited eventual impact. And this work resulted in uh, Alira at the time, now being brought out by Abbott, um, developing exactly a test that matched this profile. So we also try to, to use this to input into the medium term strategic planning for the developers. And we work very closely with product development partnerships across malaria, um, for example, looking at vector control for looking at new drugs and the vaccines to try to understand what is needed. One area that we have worked extensively on is trying to understand the vaccines. And of course, with the current um, new vaccines coming for COVID. There's a lot of excitement about what could uh, translate across to diseases such as malaria. Um, so for example, we've worked very closely with GSK and um, the Malaria Vaccine Initiative on the RTSS malaria vaccine. And in doing so, we've embedded an antibody dose response model within the transmission model to get a better link between how vaccines are working and the likely efficacy. And this has led to us both being able to inf un better understand the likely impact of the RTSS malaria vaccine, which is now in pilot implementation in three countries, um, but also to understand what a second generation vaccine could look like. And we can generate different simulations for how the profile might change, either inducing higher antibody titers or improving the durability of that antibody response and what impact that would result in in terms of cases averted and deaths averted. So in summary, I think mathematical models are being increasingly used um, across a broad, broad spectrum of different areas to inform malaria policy at the global level, the regional level and country level, as well as, of course, the scientific community. Um, there are many different areas I think they will remain useful. There's the planning, what's going to be achievable with what tools, and that can inform, of course, both countries and regions and, and global policy, the science and the product development, trying to understand what is needed as the situation evolves, 
optimizing impact and so making the best possible use of the resources that we have and in particular focus on subnational stratification not doing the same everywhere but really tailoring intervention packages to what is needed and then for countries approaching elimination i haven't talked much about this but we're doing a lot of work trying to think about what tools are needed um, at the end stages and equally important when a country has eliminated they need to prevent reintroduction of the parasite and a lot of this ultimately ties into advocacy as well we, models are very useful of course for estimating numbers how many lives have been saved both in the past and for projecting future and this um, feeds into the advocacy that supports the global funding situation as we go forwards, of course, COVID has changed the world and how we think about things. And I believe there'll be an increasing focus on the intersection of this type of work, the modeling with economics and with the political economy. So who's making the decisions, both at the country level and the regional level, and how do these decisions affect what's happening globally? Um, building user-friendly tools, we're going to invest quite a lot in the coming years in trying to develop interfaces that can be used uh, by policymakers, again, at the global and country level. And very, very important is building local capacity, um, trying to develop the science base in countries that um, suffer from malaria to enable those scientists to support their local policies. I finally just wanted to touch on what I think from a personal perspective it takes to really achieve impact and I think it's very different from a lot of the scientific process that one might normally go through. Of course, everyone will understand that it's important to engage with the stakeholders as early as possible in the research, but often we work in our labs and we do the research, we write up the paper and then we expect it to have impact. And I think our experience has been that's the least likely time that you're like going to have impact. And what you really need to do is wind back that process and start as early as possible. So these stakeholders, whether they are policymakers, they could be the general public, um, anybody else you think might be interested in this area of research um, should have that input at the beginning, trying to think about the research priorities. And so, for example, many of the WHO committees do, do, do um, put forward recommendations for research priorities. Um, involving yourself in those discussions or keeping on top of the documents can be very helpful. Um, having those discussions with um, the stakeholders while you're shaping the planned research and even developing grant proposals is, is very helpful. And then having a continued dialogue through the process of the research, inputting into the early results and shaping the research can also be very helpful. And throughout all of these stages, of course, communication is the most important. Being able to communicate your results to a wide range of stakeholders really improves the acceptability and uptake. So throughout this, we should view all of these stakeholders as equal partners in the research. We're all in this together and having everybody's views and treating these people as partners is really very, very helpful. And I would say, ultimately, the academic publications are really often the last step in the process. And much of the impact that we achieve and have achieved over the last 10 years has been before the publication stage, sharing of results, feeling open about how you communicate your research. And much of the paper comes afterwards, paper writing, often in collaboration with the stakeholders. So I'd just like to thank, um, acknowledge the wider group um, at Imperial College, and we've had many different people contribute to this work over a, a long time period, both past and present, and their names are hopefully all represented here. And of course, this is a partnership model, so we have great partnerships with many of the institutions that I've um, listed on this slide. And of course, thank you to all the funders who have supported this work. Hi, so um, I'd just like to thank Professor Azurgani for, for such a great talk and congratulations again on your prize lecture. Um, so it's a great honour for me to be interviewing you today, particularly as an early career researcher. So I just wanted to start off by asking, you know, so your, your early career started focused on mathematics. So how did you get involved in the field of infectious diseases? 
Yeah, that's a very good question, and thank you, Fatima, um, uh, for um, for interviewing, um, take, doing this conversation. Um, so, yeah, I, I I did a degree in maths, and then I was looking around afterwards, thinking, what can I use my maths for? Um, and of course, I went to the career service, like many un undergraduates do, and they suggested something called operational research. Um, so I started a master's in in that topic, um, and through that master's degree, most of it was things about you know scheduling, like landing planes, all my planes crashed. So that was not clearly not a career path for me. Um, but what topic I came across at that time was this modeling of infectious diseases. And this was actually um, back in the early 90s. And there was quite a lot of work starting to be done around the HIV epidemic. Um, so then I looked around for uh, PhD topics and actually started on a project um, as a research assistant. Uh, working um, on gonorrhea transmission in both London and Sheffield. And actually, that's the first time I came across microbiology as a discipline. I worked with um, Professor Kathy Ison, who's a, a very well-known microbiologist, had a long history of working in that particular area. So, so following on from, from your, your PhD, you said you, you worked with sexually transmitted diseases, and then your, focus research, uh, your research focused on malaria, and more recently, you've been working on COVID-19. And it's clear from your talk that, you know, your policy work is very much embedded within your research. So who would you say has been, you know, your greatest influence in your career and really inspired you to do the work you're doing today? I think I've been inspired by many people along the way. And that's partly because I've, I've switched um, disease focus um, along the way through, through many different topics. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to, to call out one a uh, single individual. Obviously, the people who mentor you early on are really important and the people you have that nice close working relationship with. Um, and then later on, I think it, it becomes you actually become quite inspired by your own research group. And I'm always continually fascinated by the new ideas that they come up with uh, and and the thoughts they have and things I just haven't thought about. And I think that's the great thing about um, sort of team science that you're getting lots of ideas from different people, especially when it's interdisciplinary and you're getting different perspectives. Uh, I'm also obviously very motivated by the public health um, side of my work and the engagement that we have with our public health partners, particularly WHO, but other um, big international partners is really important. And that's partly because when you go to meetings uh, with those partners, you meet people from all over the world with very different perspectives, very different cultural backgrounds to how they're approaching the problem, as well as different disciplines. And I find that um, really, really motivates uh, much of our research. Well, that's a really great answer. Thank you. Um, so as, as well as your pioneering work on malaria, you, you also play a leading role in understanding the impact of COVID-19 mm -hmm. and particularly in low and middle income settings. So how has your work helped to develop strategies to control the COVID-19 outbreak? Yes, well, clearly we've all been affected quite dramatically by COVID in, in the last um, year or so. And we started working on it back in January 2020 when actually it was an interesting period because we're trying to assess what this new in infection is going to be. Is it going to cause a, a pandemic? And you start to gather all this information, and get quite concerned. And then you look around just, and everybody's just acting as normal. So it's, it's, it's a, it was a difficult early period. Um, but around mid-March, when we started doing um, presenting stuff, a lot of work was, of course, going on in the UK. It became quite apparent that not everywhere in the world will have access to all the information that's needed. Um, so we worked very closely with WHO again um, early in mid middle of March to try and get some sense of what the global pandemic would look like, but also start to produce tools that could help them to support uh, the lower middle income countries that didn't have the local capacity. And so I think it's important to stress that we didn't try to go in and sort of override local teams. Some countries, of course, have very good and strong scientific teams that can help to support policy, but others have very little and they often look to WHO and other global partners for that support. So the sorts of things we've been looking at first early on, it was really what's the potential scale um, of an epidemic in a country. And we've worked with some uh, many different countries as well as through the global partners to try and get a sense of that. And that informed the very early planning. Um, so for example, we um, helped support one of the essential supplies tools, which is thinking about how many PPE, how much PPE equipment countries would need. Of course, oxygen concentrators have become very apparent recently um, and also ventilators. 
um, and also just trying to get a sense of what the policy options were for those low middle income countries, which is very, very challenging because the sorts of lockdowns that we've had in the UK are really hard to sustain and just so economically damaging, but also damaging um, to the local population who are living day by day. Um, so we've been supporting that um, in the past. And of course, now the focus has shifted towards vaccines. Um, so a lot of the work we're currently focusing on is trying to really make this case for global vaccination. It's been really challenging to get equity in, in vaccine distribution, um, but also to support countries in their introductions and thinking of prioritising uh, the early doses. Great. So, um, so, I mean, in the wake of COVID-19, there's been an enormous amount of pressure on, on epidemiologists like yourself. I mean, we've all seen it on TV and on social media. So how has the, the political pressure surrounding the pandemic impacted your work and also the work of your group? It's been incredibly stressful, as you can imagine. And um, none of us actually, you know, a year ago would have even imagined that the sort of profile that epidemiologists have and everybody knows what an epidemiologist is now or what the role of the job is. And this whole, you know, our number, that was, that was always quite amusing to see. Um, it has been very, very stressful, and there's a combination of things that are making it stressful. Obviously, there is a pressure to produce results very, very rapidly. Um, so often there was 24, 48 hour turnarounds early on. Um, and right through, there's been a team working um, to support the UK's response. And that has been a sort of weekly um, run of models. Often all the questions come on a Friday and have to be answered by the Monday morning. So there's not many weekends off. So I think there's a relentless pressure and sometimes it feels like you're just on a sort of hamster wheel of producing things and not really getting anywhere and certainly not having any time, for example, to publish the work. Um, but then coupled with that, I think it's, it's really difficult being in the public eye and feeling like everything you do is being uh, assessed. So recently, and I'm sure we'll have in the next few weeks, we've got essentially peer review by the national press. Um, some aspects of the national press are, are quite, have, have their perspectives and they're quite um, negative towards us. And that is really challenging because you do see it and you do tend to take it personally, like everybody, there are people behind all, all of these things. And I think that's true across the whole response. So, so how have you been able to juggle both your advisory work and also manage your research group at the same time? And, and all your, your appearances on TV and working with the media. How do you, how do you yeah, manage all of that? Yeah, probably terribly, actually. And probably <laughs> the research group will say they're the, piece, they're the people who start to um, um, receive less attention. I mean, I mean, I've been very, very lucky. A lot of the researchers that are, that are working and helping support COVID that I'm working with are actually my, my group that were previously on malaria. So one of the challenges we've had is to try and keep up the support for the malaria side of things, as well as trying to... Um, respond to this COVID pandemic and we sort of split 50-50 and luckily there's some very um, strong people in the group. We've built up a large malaria group so that's been um, possible to achieve. Um, but also it's, it's just great um, how you know people have stepped up and are managing themselves in a sense and managing to do the work. There's a very good group ethos, a lot of collaboration, a lot of um, talking but also that support to keep the group going um, because inevitably people are going up and down. Uh, so, yeah, it, it is really, really difficult. Um, we don't do anywhere near as many media appearances as we're, uh, as are requested. I mean, I get called every single day by the media and I just ignore the phone most of the time now. So we just start to select those things um, because I think the, it's important to get the message out and media is, is great for doing that. But you could just get swallowed up with responding to that all the time. Um, and we also think it's very important that we are responding to the public health um, needs and that is a, a lot of that is of course through our, our global partners as well as the UK response. Yeah so you touched on um, you know how you said part of your group are, are focusing on malaria so Covid has, has dominated the news for the past year but you know people are still dying of other diseases like malaria so what kind of impact has the pandemic had on the progress of reducing malaria transmission? Um, well, it, it's a very good question, and actually it's, it's quite hard to tell because, of course, we're still slightly in the midst of it. Uh, early on, there was a concern that um, the net distributions and nets are really important for prevention. Um, so bed nets might not go out, and there was really a concerted effort at the global level to try and make sure that those nets that were, were able to get into countries and, and be delivered in a safe way. And actually, that has been quite successful. So all the net campaigns that were 
um, planned in 2020 did go ahead. Some of them were slightly, of course, slightly delayed, um, but they did happen. And that was really important. What we're struggling actually to get information on at the moment is the impact, of course, that um, health systems and the strain that's been put on health systems is having on treatment. Um, and that is going to be challenging. And of course, it comes and goes as, as, the, as the COVID pandemic um, evolves. So much of the malaria uh, globally, as I've said, is in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so far, there hasn't been such an impact in some of those areas or not a visible impact. And there's, of course, a weak surveillance for COVID just as there is for malaria. Um, unfortunately, of course, what's happening in India at the moment is going to have a big impact. India does actually have um, ongoing malaria transmission, had very made really good progress towards trying to reduce that burden and, and aiming for malaria elimination. I think just in the last um, two to three years prior to the COVID pandemic, they had really pushed down malaria by uh, at least half and maybe more in some areas. Um, so of course, there's going to be concern that that's going to have quite a big impact. And what we see is as malaria has been pushed down, if you take your foot off the pedal, it just comes roaring back again. And because people have lost, slightly lost immunity and so they are actually more susceptible than they would have been. Um, and and so in the past couple of weeks, we've we've heard about this new vaccine that's you know been on the news, which demonstrates around seventy seven percent efficacy, which is incredible. So do you think it's quite a big question? But do you think this vaccine has the the potential to eradicate malaria along with um, other vaccines like RTSS? Yeah, so this is the um, the R21 um, vaccine that's been developed by the Jenner Institute, and they had their first uh, preprint out, I think it was about a week ago, um, which is really, really encouraging. And, and the important thing about it is that it's essentially using the same approach as the RTSS vaccine, the older vaccine. Um, but the RTSS vaccine was manufactured or put constructed over 20 years ago, so using much older technology. So this new R21 vaccine is really, I think, much more immunogenic. So it's producing much higher um, antibody titers and also T cell responses in the individuals that are vaccinated. And this is probably why we're seeing higher efficacy. So I'm very, very excited about the potential of this vaccine. Obviously, there's only been a phase two trial that's relatively small, but I mean, we've had similar evidence for COVID vaccines and we've got excited. So there's, there's room to be optimistic. Um, the phase three trials will go ahead. Um, and I think what's also important is that I think there's a potential now post COVID to really get vaccines out much more quickly. Um, so RTSS has been stuck you know, in a really slow process. The phase two trials were 15 odd years ago. So it's been taking a long time to get that particular vaccine out. If this new vaccine can be developed and it will go, it will be manufactured potentially by the Serum Institute in India, um, there is really potential for that to have a really big impact. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to eradicate malaria. And the reasons are that transmission is really intense in some areas. And the challenges, of course, are always, even if you've got a very highly effective um, efficacious vaccine, you need to get it into the arms of, of the people affected. And that's, of course, going to be challenging to get a very high levels of cover coverage, particularly in the rural areas and those that don't typically access care. But I think it will make a, a, a major difference if we can get a vaccine with that sort of profile out yeah. to the population. Brilliant. Um, so coming back to, to your career, what would you say is your biggest achievement? If you had to choose one, which one would you say you're particularly proud of? Oh, goodness. Because <laughs> yes. you look back and go, I don't know if I've really achieved anything. But actually, I think it is the malaria work. I've been really, really um, focused on that um, for, for over a decade. And I think it really is getting that modelling perspective into the way that the global community thinks about malaria. Um, they were very, very sceptical when I first rocked up in WHO and said, we've got these models, do you think they'd be useful? Like, oh, people have come before, they're no use to us. <laughs> so um, I think it's actually that side of it, is getting that um, use of the models and developing the models so that they can be helpful to inform policy. And hopefully, I ultimately hope that they will be usable by um, in-country, both by research institutions and, and um, public health partners to help guide how to optimise control. So what advice would you give to early career researchers like myself who are looking to pursue a career in academia and how should we go about engaging with policymakers? Yes, I mean, uh, the, of course, early career researchers, you've got a lot of advice around, around the academic career, but I think the science is changing. Um, so obviously what the experiences that I had will be very different to the experience that you will have and other early career researchers. 
Um, there's a lot more team science, I feel, and I think that's really a great thing. So I would feel nowadays that you can be, feel less obsessed about whether you've got first author papers and where you've published them. I don't think that really matters anymore. What matters is what your contribution is. And that, I think, will enable people to work together more. And, and that's, I find, a much more enjoyable experience than sitting on your own and trying to, to, to do your own research on your own. Um, in terms of engaging, I think engaging as early as possible, as I said in the talk, is really, really important. And the more that you do engage with anybody who is interested, this might just be your friends and family to begin with in terms of public engagement, but also um, just getting, you know, getting into the wider groups, looking at the opportunities that are available in, in your university to do public engagement. I think you'll find that this also directs your research and helps you to think about what is relevant and what is most useful um, and, and helps you sort of build your career. And I think if you have all those things and you keep that enthusiasm for the science, then you'll inevitably, of course, be successful. That's, that's really great advice. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, so, so COVID has, has shed light on, on these transmission disease models. So do you see the change in epidemiology impacting positively on research over the next, let's say, 10 years? Um, I hope so. Um, but it's, of course, there's a little bit of a mixed message coming through from the UK government at the moment. Um, so on, on one side, you know, there's a lot of talk about not, not just epidemiology, but being prepared. Um, and pandemic preparedness was, was, you know, being discussed 20 years ago, um, certainly emerged and, and went up the agenda following the first emergence of SARS in 2003. But then it slipped back a bit. And I think that, of course, is going to be right at the top of everyone's agenda and that tied to the whole uh, global health security agenda. Um, but in terms of other, other areas, of course, I really want to get back to the focus on malaria and the recent cuts to ODA research funding are just terrible and they're having a huge impact. Um, just trials being stopped midway or not mid recruitment, um, large projects being just um, cut and, and staff, of course, are going to be made unemployed by that. And I think that's really very short sighted um, because my experience has been many of the people who were able to respond to the COVID pandemic were able to do so because of the ODA funding that came in and those staff being in place. Um, so I do hope that, that those decisions can be reversed and we can really focus on not thinking just of a one disease or one focal point and pouring all the money into COVID, but really realizing that all of these pathogens and all these microbes are really, really important to understand and that science needs to be funded. So I just have one last question. Um, I think we need to quickly wrap up soon, but what are the biggest lessons we can learn as scientists from this pandemic, do you think? Oh goodness, that's a, that's a, that's a huge <laughs> question. Um, I Probably better, uh, yeah. Um, I think we can learn to be flexible and that has taught us to be flexible as scientists and not to follow one route. Um, also to appreciate that we're often going to be wrong. I think that's been the biggest lesson for me is that, you know, we realize you make mistakes early on. Um, I think owning up to those is a reasonable thing to do even in the public eye when you can obviously get bashed quite a bit um, because we're always learning. And I think that's what we as scientists always do but sometimes it's very difficult to say, okay, that public paper I published five years ago, actually now I think it probably isn't that, that good or that useful. Sometimes we ought to just be more open about the fact that not everything we've written down is actually necessarily right. And science is finding its way by making mistakes. So I think that is pro pro probably the thing I've learned the best is to own up to and, and feel comfortable about making mistakes, even if you're in the public eye. Okay, great. So I think I need to wrap up now. Um, so I'd like to thank you again for your talk and congratulations and thank you for your time today. Um, so I just need to remind everyone that the recording of the session will be available um, from the 5th of May on the virtual platform for one month. And coming up next are four parallel sessions which start at 10 a.m. So please make your way back to the platform to select the session you wish to attend. Thank you. Thank you.